God, that intro music just hits. I love it. I love it. I love it. Welcome back to the Opinionated Idiot YouTube channel. How's everybody doing? It's Sunday evening. I hope everybody had an amazing weekend. I need to get my detective glasses on. I feel better with these on here, but hope everybody's doing well. I hope that everybody had an amazing weekend as I did as well. I want to appreciate everybody here over on the channel that has come over to check out the channel here over in the past. I think I've only been around about a week, a week on this channel. I'm not, I'm not foreign to YouTube. I've had a YouTube channel, another YouTube channel for about a year and a half. Uh, I monetized on that channel, but wanted to shift content in a different direction. So I just started the opinionated idiot channel. One thing I do want to do and talk about this evening before I go on to the stream and the material that I have planned for the stream this evening is that I'm I'm seeing a lot of chatter and a lot of hate out there, I guess, against channels like this that we're talking about the Koberger case, we're talking about the Ohio Four. Um, you know, look, this is, it's a public knowledge case. It's a very interesting case. It's a very you know, tragic case that is through the entire world right now that people want to know about this, want to study it, want to understand it. So I don't see anything wrong what we're doing here on YouTube versus what people are doing in forums. They're talking about the same thing that we are. And I wanted to make it very clear that when I started this channel, that I would stick to fact, fact based information, I wasn't going to speculate, I have not done that in this on this YouTube channel, I was not going to speculate, I was going to stick to fact, fact driven information. And now that we have the unsealed probable cause affidavit, you know, we can do that, we can look through this and study it, and go through the information in it. This is public knowledge. It can be talked about. It can be discussed. And also what I wanted to make very clear on here as well is that, you know, just because names have been said, it doesn't give anybody the right to harass anybody. And that's not what I'm ever going to do here. But it does give me the right to discuss information in here. And it does give us the right to talk about that because I do believe in free speech and I believe everybody has an opinion and I have and I believe that everybody has a voice. Everybody should be able to talk about things that go on in this world that are out there in the media that are going on in our in our everyday lives. We should be able to talk about those things. So I just wanted to set those rules very clear here that I will always stick to fact based driven information. I will not speculate. I would not say that someone did something uh, and not accuse anybody of it. And everybody here in life, if ever accused in any type of crime, has the right to a fair trial. Uh, and, you know, they, they can go through the due process to, to be found guilty or innocent. So uh, I just want to clarify that this evening before kicking off the broadcast. So where are we right now in the Brian Koberger processy? You know, we had the unsealed probable cause affidavit the other day, unreleased to the public. We've been able to kind of digest it over the last, what, couple of days here. And, you know, there's been a lot of, um, still a lot of speculation. You know, as I said, that this is one of the most fact, you know, factual full of, you know, such intricate detail affidavit that I have ever read through. Um, and, you know, this is just a probable cause. So this is just to, you know, file that arrest warrant. And, um, but anyway, what I wanted to do was pull up a quick video, actually a couple of them here. I want to pull through before I go into the material that I, that I prepared this evening. Um, let's do this first. So let's look at the five revelations so far in the Brian uh, Koberger uh, murder trial. So let's, let's check this out. <clears throat> Do you understand these rights? Yes. I am now going to go over the criminal complaint with you. By the way, big shout out to law and crime sidebar. Uh, and if you haven't checked out the 
uh, law, <clears throat> law and crime network, go over and check that out. Very fact-based driven uh, information there as well. So big shout out to them. And I'm sure that they won't mind me using some of the material on my little small uh, YouTube channel here. So let's go through this. And then we're going to go into um, what I have prepared this evening. We go over the five biggest revelations from the newly unsealed probable cause affidavit in the University of Idaho murder case. I'm joined by Jeanette Levy and legendary former homicide detective Bill Waters. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law and Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. <clears throat> and again, the maximum penalty for this offense, if you plead guilty or are found guilty, is up to death and imprisonment for life. Do you understand? Yes. Well, I will tell you that I was not expecting this amount of detail in the probable cause affidavit. This was an affidavit from Moscow police officer Brett Payne in support of an arrest warrant of Brian Koberger. Now, Pro Koberger has officially been extradited back to Idaho after his arrest in Pennsylvania. He now faces four counts of first-degree murder and burglary for allegedly stabbing to death University of Idaho students Madison Mogan, Zahner Kernodal, Ethan Chapin, and Kaylee Gonsalves inside of their off-campus home. And one thing that I want to make sure that everybody understands is I don't want to lose sight of the victims in all of this. And I know that a lot of the focus now has been on Brian because Brian is, you know, the alleged uh, suspect that has committed these crimes. He's been formally arrested for them, but we want to make sure that we don't lose sight of the victims. And, um, you know, I don't want anybody to lose sight of this case because I I'm going to tell you right now, this case is probably going to take a while to get through. Um, and that's something that I'm going to talk a little bit uh, later here in my broadcast, but I don't want anybody to lose sight of what's going on. I don't want anybody to lose sight of the the victims and, and lose sight of this case. Let's keep it to the forefront. Let's keep that open conversation going about it. Their bodies were found on November 13th of last year. Koberger has had his initial appearance in Idaho court. No bail was set. He was read the charges. He's due back in court January 12th for a status hearing that will precede a preliminary hearing. But we have to talk about this probable cause affidavit. 19 pages. It has been released. And wow. Just wow. Let me bring in my co-host here on Sidebar and correspondent <coughs> for the Law and Crime Network, Anjanette Levy, who's live in Idaho right now. And we also have with us legendary former homicide investigator Phil Waters, who's been following this case from the very beginning. It's great to have you both on. Phil, I am going to start with you. You called it. And the type of knife that they're talking about is the United States Marine Corps K-Bar. So when I saw this, my thought was is that is this person prior military so the specific weapon if they're talking about a k-bar which is what this is uh then there's a possibility that they need to look into military background of some kind you called it we asked you about a month ago about the murder weapon which hasn't been recovered and you pretty much nailed it because <clears throat> this is from the affidavit as I entered this bedroom, I could see two females in the single bed in the room. Both Gonsalves and Mogan were deceased with visible stab wounds. I also later noticed what appeared to be a tan leather knife sheath laying on the bed next to Mogan's right side. The sheath was later processed and had K-Bar, USMC, and the United States Marine Corps Eagle Globe and Anchor Insignia stamped on the outside of it. The Idaho State Lab later located a single source of male DNA. I wonder if there's any military surplus stores around WSU or around in the Moscow area. I mean, would would Brian be, you know, allegedly so stupid to go and just purchase this, you know, weapon right in and around the area? Would would he allegedly be so brazen to do that? It just makes you wonder. It makes you kind of wonder. It was just like something like an Amazon buy or purchase or something like that. So they left on the button snap of the knife sheet. Phil, what do you think? Well, I tell you, I don't know that I nailed it. The the first part of that was a, a K bar was what they talked about at the very beginning. Very specific about that being a K bar and one plus one still equals two. So I surmise in fact i think um, when we first talked about this i showed you the k bar that i have in that same type of sheet sitting in my office at my home so the 
I just think it's it's interesting that as brilliant as he has been portrayed to be, that he has left that piece of evidence behind at the scene. And, and that's what we talk about, you know, the suspect who has this, uh, you know, studying criminology and an interest in police to leave allegedly such an important piece of evidence is just makes no sense. And Jeanette, we don't know where he got this weapon, allegedly got this weapon from or how it was obtained. And not only that, can you also tell us the significance of the DNA on that sheath and how they were able to match it back to uh, Koberger? Well, it's incredibly significant because the affidavit says that the DNA came from a single male contributor, and they were able to determine that it came from uh, Brian Koberger. But the way they were able to determine that, according to the affidavit, was through going... That's allegedly. That's allegedly. That's going to be... You know, that's got to be really looked over in court. And I, I'm going to talk about that trash a little later home here in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania, <laughs> where Brian Koberger was later arrested. And it said that it was like a ninety nine point nine 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 eight percent match or something, some crazy, you know, percentage uh, likely to be the son of, you know, Michael Koberger. So there's been a lot of discussion and reporting out there that this happened through genetic genealogy. <clears throat> that they were able to get the dad's DNA through that. And so we're thinking maybe that's likely true since it discussed that in the probable cause affidavit. They went through the trash, got some things, items of DNA uh, from that trash and were able to make an identification and link things together through there. And Anjanette, just real quick follow-up. We don't know if, you know where the knife was purchased. If I know there was talk about whether or not Koberger's father was former military, but nothing like that. We don't have any indication, right? We have no indication of that. One of our viewers asked a question about that, whether or not maybe his father had once been in the military. Mm. Uh, but, you know, this is the type of thing where you could probably find this online or the pawn shop, what have you. They, they may be, you know, out there floating around. Mm. Okay. So now, Phil, I want to bring your attention to this because later on in the affidavit, they say a short time later, DM, who, by the way, is the roommate. It was one of the two roommates on the ground floor, a surviving roommate. I use that word interestingly because this is what she said. In the affidavit, she said that she heard or she thought that she heard what was Gonsalves say something. Whoa, that was crazy. And not to – that was a phone booth. I haven't seen a phone booth in forever. Look at that. Wow. That's crazy. It doesn't look like there's a phone in there, but – or in the affidavit, she said that she heard or she thought that she heard uh, was Gonsalves say something to the effect of there's someone here. DM stated that she looked out of her bedroom but did not see anything when she heard the comment about someone being in the house. DM said that she opened a door a second time when she heard what she thought was crying coming from Kernodal's room. DM then said that she heard a male voice say something to the effect of it's OK, I'm going to help you. That is so eerie. That is so eerie. DM opened her door for the third time after she heard the crying and saw a figure clad in black, black clothing, and a mask that covered the person's mouth and nose walking towards her. Hmm. DM described the figure as 5'10 or taller, male, not very muscular, but athletically built with bushy eyebrows. The male walked past DM as she stood in a frozen shock phase. The male walked towards the back sliding glass door. DM locked herself in her room after seeing the male. She said she did not recognize the male. And this leads investigators to believe that the murderer left the scene. We had no idea this happened. Phil, mm. What's your reaction to that? I think that is just good police work in terms of what was released at the beginning. Of yeah, and kudos to the Moscow Police Department and the FBI working on this case. The detail in this probable cause affidavit is amazing, and they did a really great job putting this together, and, and they know, they knew that they had to put together a solid, informational, very meticulous probable cause affidavit to get this arrest warrant, and you know, I am just ready to see the details of this case in court and, and really see all the meticulous things and, and, and uh, information that was captured uh, during this investigation. Because I'm telling you, everything, and that's what a lot of people need to understand, anything in this 
probable cause affidavit is just a summary of what is there. We're not we're not open to the all the true facts in this case. You're going to hear a lot more information uh, that that is not in this affidavit, and I am so curious to hear all of that. <clears throat> uh, we were told at the beginning that the roommates on the first floor heard nothing. And there were a lot of pundits, a lot of people offering their opinions that that was just amazing. That couldn't have happened. And this and so forth and so on, as though that was supposed to be revealed at that time. And I think, I, I don't know this for certain, but my, my reading of that would be that was done for the protection of those witnesses and did not want to let anyone know that they had, in fact, hmm seen more than what was conveyed in yeah and we time. may hear that at trial that's the thing we may hear these details at trial initial press release <clears throat> Phil, does it make it odd that if this is true he why wouldn't he have killed her and the second question is why did she not immediately make a phone call we know <laughs> that a phone call was made from that residence either from her or the other roommate um at almost noon the next day what's your response to people who are questioning this well, people do different things under stress. And while it's detailed in the affidavit that she saw these things, we don't know that he saw anything. For everybody He's that's around in the dark, He's just joining the stream, we're doing a quick kind of catch up moment here of what we found out over the last couple of days. I'm using the uh, law and crime sidebar, and that's on the law and crime network. If you haven't gone over, Go over and check them out. Give them a, a, a subscribe on their channel. It's a really great fact-based driven channel. And uh, just like here, I, I like to use facts and not speculate. So we'll keep moving through this here. This mask and I do have a, a presentation in just a little bit here. So let's get, let's get through this. Nose and his mouth. He's already done what he's going to do or he's on his way to do it. He's already focused on where he's headed and whether it's to leave and apparently it's it's to leave the structure so he's not getting distracted with things going on around him and remember it's dark in there so there's certainly what it indicates to me is that he didn't see her she saw him which which was certainly to her uh, her benefit yeah and, and you know there's also like you said how do you judge somebody in that position for what they did maybe she froze maybe she panicked and yeah, i gotta and, talk to you yeah and just, yeah, so i'll just, give you a final word on that. to address the the, the lack of a phone call at that point in time. Uh, she locked the door and she was away from it and then she saw the guy leave. So maybe she thought at that point, he's gone, you know, I, I'm, I'm locked in and, and we're done here, not having any idea what had actually happened. And Jeanette, I got to go to <clears throat> some of the biggest piece of evidence. I mean, how did they track him, right? We talked about the DNA. The cell phone evidence I find to be so crucial. Can you briefly summarize for our listeners and our viewers, the significance of the cell phone evidence? The cell phone evidence is incredibly significant. And one of the key pieces there is the fact that his cell phone pinged off of a tower on the night of the murders at certain points in time. But during a period of time in that window, there's no signal from this cell phone. And I think that's really interesting. And it doesn't come back <clears throat> on. That cell phone doesn't start hanging against a tower again until after police believe the homicides were committed. Also, that cell phone evidence, according to the affidavit, shows that he was in the area of that home on at least 12 occasions mm. between August and November 13th. That August uh, stop one of the incidents or instances in which his phone was determined to be in that area of the King Road house was on August 21st of that year. He was pulled over at 11.40 p.m. Uh, near the house for a seatbelt violation, and that's a Sunday night. So you would think a PhD student, if it was indeed him and his phone in this area, remember he's uh, maintaining his, his innocence, uh, why is he out and about at 11.40 p.m. at night? So the cell phone wow, evidence in this case students are and i'm not defending them but you know students are out at all time as we know i mean we saw all that cell phone uh cell phone that uh police camera footage the body camera footage i mean there was there's students you know in college in general students come and go at all hours of the night so 
Um, you know, I'm not defending him at all, but I'm just saying that there's a lot of activity around a school or a college. Case that <clears> I think <throat> is very significant. I don't think you can And that's probably something that, you know, the defense is going to use, you know, something it's like just that. Another the kind of piece of the mosaic that is going to, you know, paint this picture that they kept talking about. Law enforcement kept saying they were getting new pieces of information that really painted a picture appreciate of everybody what hanging out this evening on the, night. And I think it's on my channel if you take a quick moment please hit that, that thumbs picture. up button down yeah down so below. there was a question about if, if and i do have a poll up there at the top well, of the chat said, 12 times before this do you night, think they have the cell phone ryan Koberger is guilty you know by the house take a minute hit that hit that poll his cell phone turns off during the time of the murders and then comes back on right afterwards. So that's significant. You know, Phil, we talk about how this guy, you know, the suspect is a criminology student, has this interest in criminology, and yet leaving this breadcrumb of trails. The cell phone evidence is one thing. Phil, let's talk about the car itself, the white Hyundai Elantra, which mm. we were all on the search for, because based on this affidavit, to give everybody an idea about the car, there were cameras tracking the car's movement for a long time. And there was even one surveillance video where they see him exit the car. So we know that it belongs to him. We know it's registered to him. They have this car leaving WSU at 2.44 in the morning on the night of the murders. It makes its way to Moscow. It initially makes passes of the house in the early morning hours. It enters the area at 4.04 a.m. and then drives fast from that crime scene at 4.20 a.m. And then is back in Washington at 5.25 a.m. And then back at the scene at 9. Again, what is your reaction to the way police were able to track him? Just good old-fashioned detective work. I said from the beginning that that's what's going to crack this case. And that's what they did. These guys hit the grindstone and put their noses to it. And the first one of the first things they're going to do, and we've talked about this before, Jesse, is that they're going to go out there and they're going to try to draw from any kind of video surveillance evidence that they can draw from. And again, I, I want to I want to commend Chief James Fry and his team in Moscow and the FBI you know, during this case and assisting with the investigation in this case. And I know there were a lot of people that were frustrated that there wasn't a lot more information that was being released to the public, but they had to keep this case so close to their chest to, uh, to not let anything spill out. You know, as we knew Brian's uh, movements across the country into Pennsylvania, they didn't want this guy to run. They wanted to, to nail him down and make sure that he was 100% the person that they were looking for before they could uh, put out this uh, arrest uh, arrest warrant for him. So really great job. And that's <clears throat> exactly what they did. Uh, in reference to the, the, the cell phone, I, I guess he was brilliant enough to turn it off when he was in there doing what he was allegedly doing, but he wasn't smart enough or didn't think about the fact that he needed to turn it off the entire time that he's He's making his uh, reconnaissance of that structure and those people. Andrea, we got about a minute. I want to really briefly talk about this because I thought this was another big. He'll be on Island Life says guilty. And I think he's uh, he knew he's known at least one of the victims. He will plead out when he's presented with the vast amount of evidence they have against him. It's quite possible. It is quite possible. And that's kind of the scenario that I keep going back in my head as well, that he, I think he knew someone or has been in this house before. And I, you know, and as we go through my presentation here in a couple of minutes, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I'm going to talk about. Big revelation. Um, we learned some background history on the defendant as well. Didn't we? We learned about his interest in criminology. I know there was a Reddit post. That was interesting as well. Can you tell our viewers, our listeners, what we learned about his interest and background? I think it's really interesting about the Reddit post uh, that he, you know, they cited that in the affidavit because that is one of the first things we found when we started looking for information after we learned his name last Friday. And it was this a survey that had been posted asking for criminals to respond or people who had committed crimes to talk about their emotions. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be really um, interesting that the police found that that was worth mentioning in the probable cause affidavit. And I want to know why they felt that was important, talking about the emotions that people feel, uh, what, what, they're, what they're trying to get at when they put that in the probable cause affidavit. Obviously, uh, criminology 
Uh, we know that he is a PhD student studying that. We know from talking to students at DeSales University, he had taken undergraduate classes, uh, one taught by Catherine Ramsland, uh, who specializes in serial killers. So uh, we learned uh, that they, the police were on to all of this. And I think another funny thing about this, or not not funny per se, but interesting thing is that the whole time- Hey, Tiana, how are you? Thanks for joining the stream. I hope you had a nice weekend. Him. They were on to him in November, late November. So I thought that was an, another interesting part of this. Yeah, I agree, because that goes into more of the idea of motive, you know, the motivation, what would have led someone to do this. What we didn't get from this affidavit very clearly is the why. Yeah, Maybe we'll get that later on, but right now. I think that's going to be something that, that comes out in the case. Um, I'm going to move on from this video here. It's pretty much complete anyway, and um, I just have a couple of more, and then I want to get into the the kind of the the meat of the bone that I have this evening planned. Uh, there is, there was a new video that came out on the Long Crime Network this afternoon, actually this this evening now, about two hours ago on there, and they were talking about now searching for the possible murder weapon, and I do want to go through that video as well because uh, I do feel like it's a very important topic to to discuss as well too. So let's play through this. During the Idaho College student murders investigation, Moscow police contacted the makers of the knife, <clears throat> the murder weapon. The probable cause affidavit says that officers found the sheath to a K-bar knife next to Madison Mogan's body. DNA on, on that sheath helped police connect Brian Kohlberger to the scene. The director of sales and marketing for K-bar told TMZ that investigators contacted the company about the knives and sheaths they sell but K-Bar did not have any records of someone named Brian Koberger mm. purchasing one. Experts say the knife that would fit the sheath is a seven-inch utility knife, commonly used as a tool by campers and hunters. While police haven't found the knife itself, the sheath with Koberger's DNA is on it. It's a pretty big get for the prosecution. Wouldn't you agree, Terry? I think it's a huge get for the prosecution. Anytime you can get either the weapon that committed the crime or something associated with that weapon, you're doing well. And here they have that sheath. And according to the affidavit, it was found next to one of the bodies and it did have DNA on it. And definitely that's going to help convict Koberger. I think it's probably one of the best pieces of evidence they have at this time. If they, of course, can find that knife, that's going to really solidify you know, this case. But for right now, having the sheath, he dropped it. It was a huge mistake on his part. Knowing that he is someone who has specialized, has a master's degree, working on his PhD in criminology. Hmm. That was a huge mistake if, in fact, he is the one who dropped that chief next to the body. Yeah, I agree with you, Terry. The DNA evidence looks strong. In my experience, the DNA evidence tends to always look strong in arrest affidavits, though. Prosecutors love using it, and judges love signing off on warrants when they see it. What I would say is, Let's wait and see. Hmm. With Koberg arrested and probable cause made out for the arrest, they also have probable cause to take a swab of the inside of his cheek for DNA. No, if that swab comes, now if that swab comes back as a match for the suspect on the sheath, it limits your arguments but doesn't eliminate them. Then we- and What he's saying is it limits the arguments for defense, but it doesn't eliminate them. And then it can go in the reverse direction as well too. Say it comes back to- for the prosecution and it doesn't match or it comes back inconclusive you got a real problem because now it just falls into circumstantial with all the cell phone and and, and camera footage and this is what i'm going to be talking about in a couple of minutes so let me get through this here and uh, we start talking we'll get, about we'll get to the presentation crime scenes and how much of Kohlberger's dna was on the sheet very little then maybe the police mishandled the evidence a lot of dna maybe touching things and, and passing it around that argument um, might work but if the dna test uh, negative or mm. inconclusive for Koberger, that's, that's where this case gets really yep. crazy because the defense may have a real case on right. their hands. So for the DNA, I say, wait and see. Yep. Yeah, you know what, Brian? That sheath isn't the only piece of evidence that the police have. They also have footprints yep. and it's based on blood. And if in fact, those footprints are found to be footprints from shoes that Koberger wore, I think that sort of seals the case. Mm -hmm. Now look, they know for yeah, and you know, you also have to look at another angle that could seal this case too, is now we found out that Koberger was outside his parents' home cleaning his white Elantra 
uh, with with surgical gloves on. That's what led FBI to be able to obtain the arrest warrant, the uh, um, PCA, um, and, and arrest Koberger. And I'm sure <laughs> the FBI has processed that car a hundred percent pattern they can look for shoes with that pattern they've already stated that it's a diamond and pattern. if they find any inkling of the four victims blood dna anything a hair fiber a uh, clothing fiber in that car bam 100 percent done going to jail or, or death penalty the rest of your life you know and close to a van shoe and if it turns <clears throat> out he has those shoes in his closet or he's ever purchased shoes that have that pattern i think it's going to be just like a fingerprint mm. and it will definitely seal the case for the prosecution as far as that's concerned and we've seen it in other cases i mentioned this before. and she's correct you know they've even used in cases um uh there was a case up in canada of a colonel, and I and I forget his name off the top of my head, but um, they've used used uh, tires, tire tracks, and matched tire tracks to to tires that was on his truck, and placed him uh, to the scene of that crime. So um, you know, like just like shoe prints, tire prints can be used as well. Or it convicted George Wagner the fact that he had shoes that were very similar to those shoes <clears> that <throat> were found at the footprint in those crime scenes. So if they can do something like that here, they will really, I think, seal the deal. Yeah. Did anybody think that he wanted to get caught? You know, allegedly, if this is if this is Koberger, allegedly, if Koberger did this, does anybody think he might have left that just? to get caught, to go through this process that he was so, uh, in, 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 you know, engrossed in being, a maybe being a murderer and, and wanted to, to get caught in this crime and go through the process. Maybe this was a fantasy of his. Did anybody ever think of that? Terry, but that's a big and many, many ifs. If they can connect it to Koberger, then that's great. But if not, then this whole shoe print, it's a nothing burger. Part of the problem is that this house has a lot of partygoers and people coming in and out. The other issue is that the authorities are relying on the testimony of Dylan, who described how this mass figure was moving <clears> through <throat> the house. If the defense can discredit something as small as the direction of this person was, was moving in the house, her memory of the events because she was rightfully terrified, she was tired, maybe not sober, or there is no link to Koberger and this shoe, then this argument uh, the defense can use to plant a seed of doubt mm. in the case and the investigation and argue if they're wrong here, what else are they wrong about? The defense could use this issue to make a mountain out of a molehill, so to speak, and enough of them could cause problems for the prosecution's case. I think we kind of see a preview of what the trial might look like when it actually happens, <laughs> you know, sometime later. Thanks to both of you for breaking that down. Coming up on Long Crime Daily, children left behind when a parent dies in an accident caused by a drunk driver. Today's show in Memphis, Tennessee, where Lewis, Missouri, an alleged drunk driver killed Cordell. Okay, we're going to get off that. And I'm going to bring up the presentation that I have. I have planned. Sorry. I, I know I always kind of look up. I have actually a screen up here above me. Um, and that's kind of what I'm looking at here. So you're probably like, why is he always looking up? <laughs> I'm looking up at the screen. <laughs> uh, let me find my my paper that I had here. Okay, perfect. Let's do this. Da -da 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 okay, here we go. This is what I was looking for. And we want to do this. Okay, so what I want to do now is kind of go through <clears throat> how strong is the case against Brian Koberger. And, you know, what I want to do is make sure that everybody remembers that everything in an arrest affidavit is not complete. This is just a probable cause arrest affidavit. And you won't hear all the complete details in this case until trial. And that has been the biggest thing that everybody's been complaining about. Oh, this is all they have. This is all that they have to arrest him. This is going to be the entire case. No, this is just to be printed in front of a judge for a judge to look at and make the determination that this person can be a uh, arrested for the, you know, 
tied to allegedly to, to doing these crimes. So that's why it's not as detailed. And you're going to, like I said, you're going to find out in trial, there is going to be a lot of evidence. And I think that this is going to go one or two ways. I think that the prosecution is going to have so much evidence that it's almost going to be a slam dunk right away, or there is going to be a long trial with very meticulous angles and information that's going to be sort through and digested. And, um, you know, that's all the stuff that I like to get into and I like to, I like to hear. So anyway, um, this is a, in a probable cause. And another thing too, is that everybody's always guilty is guilty. A probable cause affidavit is, is, is not, is means that you're not guilty. Uh, and you're as, as guilty as you think Koberger is, you know, as he, he may be right now, he still has the right to a fair trial. And that's how our judicial system works. And you have to keep that in mind. Everybody is presumed innocent until proven guilty. So he's got to go through the process. He has to get due process. And that's just the way that our system, our system works. So what I did here is I broke down now is some things that could help uh, the prosecution. And we'll look at all the circumstantial evidence so far in this, in this, uh, this case. So um, you look at Koberger himself. He's a PhD student at an, at nearby Washington State University, which is like what ten miles from uh, where King Road is. So he's in and around that area. He's familiar with that area. He travels that area. We know now that Brian owns uh, the white Hyundai Elantra that's been seen all over uh, camera footage. Uh, closed capture camera footage in and around that area. Um, we have lots of camera and cell phone pings in and around that area, around King Road, around the uh, Moscow University, around obviously Washington State University. Um, he's been in and around the area of King Road for months before the murders. So we know that. We know that his cell phone has pinged. They have camera data, uh, camera footage as well of his car being in that area. The police tracked tracked the car that may have been Brian's to and from the crime scene. Investigator also canvassed the area of King Road to collect video footage, which revealed a white sedan later identified as a white Hyundai Elantra traveling towards the home around 3.30, making several passes around the house and departing uh, the area around 4.20 a.m. at a high rate of speed. Uh, security footage from the campus of Washington State University in Pullman, Washington, where Koberger's graduate student showed a similar white sedan heading in the direction of Moscow about 15 minutes away across the state line shortly before 3 a.m. and then appearing to return around 5.30 a.m. Um, on November 29th, police searched uh, vehicles registered to Washington State University students revealed a 2015 white Hyundai Elantra registered to Koberger, originally with Pennsylvania plates that were later registered in Washington. And then also we know in the circumstantial evidence is that he returned back to the scene at 9 a.m. So a lot of circumstantial evidence. Now let's peel back all the layers on what we know as far as the physical evidence. And this is a lot of the physical evidence here that has been released in the unsealed uh, PCA. So let me get a drink of water here really quick, and we'll start going through the physical evidence. So Koberger's DNA was found on the left bottom snap of the USMC K-Bar style knife uh, sheath found on Kaylee's bed. We know that. If, uh, if Koberger's DNA comes back as a match, then it limits the defense's arguments, but doesn't eliminate them. So that it doesn't, it limits their defense, but it's not going to eliminate them. And that's something that, you know, they may be able to argue like, you know, Brian uh, was at that house before he came over, you know, maybe he was at a Halloween party and he dressed up as a I'm just throwing ideas out there. He dressed up as a soldier. He had that knife. He put it down in the house, you know, Maybe Kaylee found it and put it on her bed. 
you know, I'm just throwing anything out, uh, some theories that they could come up with, uh, and, and how, and how his DNA was on that sheath and found at the crime scene. So we know on December 27th, police in Pennsylvania recovered a DNA sample from the trash outside the Coburger family residence in Albright, Pennsylvania. And it says DNA proves at least 99.9998% of the male population would be expected to be excluded from the possibility of being the suspect's biological father. And that's what the F it's in the affidavit. Um, we know that there was a Vans type shoe print outside um, DM's door. Oh, excuse me. If it matches, if it matches his footwear, that will help. The physical description by DM is amazing. That is great. There's an eyewitness at the scene. She totally got the description of allegedly of Koberger. So it says roommate witnessed a masked athletic built figure generally matching the description of BK. Bushy eyebrows at least 5'10 approached and then left the residence uh, through the sliding glass door. Uh, Brian was spotted by the FBI cleaning the white Hyundai Elantra at parents' house in PA with medical gloves on, uh, and that's and that's what prompted the arrest warrant. So the the affidavit is is super strong. So you have a super strong affidavit based on DNA, the location data, and the FBI's help. This should nail uh, Koberger to the crime. This this should should lock it down. As far as the case. I think it's going to be a long case filled with lots of meticulous information. The case against Brian will be strong and the defense is going to have its work cut out for them. And like I said, I think that the prosecution is going to build this mega case where you just come in and literally sweep away the court in about a day. And it just points all the fingers and signs towards Koberger. The DNA lines up. It matches the footprint is uh you know matched to a shoe they find dna in the car um you know we know we have dna on the the sheath that is that is allegedly um at this point pointing towards Koberger, or it's going to be this very long you know drawn out case where there's meticulousness and 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 you know some things don't line up and you have to go into more of a a subdivide of of some specific evidence in this case. So that's why I said, <clears throat> hang in there. This case may take a long time when it goes to trial. So, okay. Now, this is how I think that the defense could argue in this case. So keep in mind, the defendant's father was not excluded. Authorities, however, do not have the suspect's DNA yet. Now, where it could go depends on when ultimately they get Koberger's DNA. So they, as far as we know, they don't have Koberger's DNA yet, um, but it does give them, because of the arrest and the PCA, it does give them uh, probable cause to swab, buckle swab Koberger's cheek and get a DNA sample. So, um, you know, that's going to be the smoking gun. That's going to be, that's going to be the one that, that, that's going to really take him down. So um, the thing that's just scary about that in the prosecution side, but could work in the defense on the defense side is the DNA uh, test could be negative or inconclusive. And that would be a huge win uh, for the defense in this case. Uh, contaminated crime scene. They could argue that, you know, maybe they get some of the police up on the stand and, and find out that there's contamination, you know, how they collect collected data and samples in this crime scene and they they come across that it's been contaminated that would be a huge win for the defense as well um one of the points that are flagged by experts came in the form of the at&t phone record scrutinized by law enforcement between 2 47 a.m and 4 48 a.m on the night of the slayings authorities say Koberger turned his cell phone off to conceal quote to conceal the location 
during the quadruple homicide that occurred at King Road Residence, area between WSU is not, and this is what you have to keep in mind, the area between WSU is not flush with cell towers. So, you know, the defense could turn around and say, hey, look, you know, he didn't turn his phone off. It just lost signal. You know, he was out driving around, maybe he couldn't sleep and, and, um, you know, big deal. It, it lost signal during that time. Uh, you know, a lot of people dropped their calls around that time. Uh, another piece of, uh, another way that the defense could come into this too is say that Brian's been at that house before. He, and they could just say he partied there, he hung out. And that's why I was saying, you know, maybe they they say something like, oh, well, he was at a, he was at a Halloween party and he dressed up as a soldier. That's how the sheath got there, et cetera. And you guys kind of get the idea of what I'm talking about there. So stalking. Uh, but he never acted on it. Maybe he just became obsessed with the one of the girls in that house. He thought she was uh, beautiful and started following her. And the defense could use, you know, Brian's just some kind of loser. He's socially awkward, uh, who lived in a university town and was obsessed with a couple of attractive young women and just followed them around, you know, but never acted on anything. Uh, if the evidence is accepted by the grand jury, the evidence tying Coburg to the crime allegedly would reflect mistakes he would have singularly trained uh, to recognize as a criminal criminology student. And, you know, that's where he could help in his public defender. Maybe there's some things that he sees in this evidence and says, hey, maybe you should explore something like this, because you have to keep in mind, he knows the process. He knows this process. He's been studying this. He has a PhD in it. So he's been studying this process. And I'm sure that they are, you know, as much as uh, they're helping in his defense, they're going to pick his mind as well and, and see where, you know, all this can could ultimately land in favor for him. Um, so, yeah, that's really some of the things that I wanted to go through and discuss this evening, uh, again, I think this is going to be a very uh, meticulous, long, very meticulous, long trial. Um, and, and again, it's going to point on a lot of things to, to, knock, to knock this one out of the park for the prosecution. The DNA, uh, the, 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 the collection of samples in that white Hyundai Elantra um, is, does the footprint have anything to do with Brian, the, the bloody footprint? Can they find the shoes that match up uh, to anywhere with, with Brian? Do they find the knife? I, I don't see that probably happening at this, uh, this juncture in the case. And um, you know, I think those are going to be probably your most, things that really lock in and say, Hey, this is, this is what did it. So the DNA is going to be the biggest one, you know, that's going to be the top, the top thing. If that comes back and it matches him 100% or, you know, what 99.998 and it puts that point, 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 point zero two percent It's him. He did it. You know, he did it. So that's really it. That's all the information that I kind of wanted to go through this evening. Um, I'm going to be back tomorrow night at the same time at eight o'clock. And what I was going to do on that stream is go through a actual walk of the crime scene. I don't have any of the crime scene photos, but kind of reenact, uh, you know, and kind of go through of what we think based on the evidence happened that evening. I'll have a presentation for that. And, uh, Again, I want to appreciate everybody for coming over, watching the stream this evening. If you could on the way out before we close this up, just give, go down there and hit that thumbs up button because it does help get this out into the algorithm, push this channel along. And uh, again, tomorrow I'll be back 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'd love for you to all come over here. Appreciate everybody for joining and subscribing on the channel. Please make sure to hit the bell notification so you get all notifications when I go live or when I drop a new video. And also, if you can just go over and interact on those videos, give them some watch time, give them some thumbs up, because that helps push all of this, uh, this channel out there in the algorithm. So thank you so much. I'll see you guys tomorrow, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Until then, again, I'm the opinionated idiot. And like they say, every <laughs> I almost screwed up my mind. Opinions are like assholes. 
and everybody's got one. I'll see you guys next time. See ya. Thank <laughs> you.